It was positive in the sense of resetting and reflecting on what we were doing and who we were as a restaurant and what we want to be when we reopen. So the, I guess the thought process started to change and I feel, I feel like, you know what, maybe it is time to just sort of look at what we're doing and what's working, what's not working. So it just became very reflective. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. A few episodes ago, Pasquale Trimboli explained that restaurants are an extension of one's personality. For many that get the chance to open their own restaurant, they not only put their life savings on the line, but every sense of themselves goes into the business too. It's often a vision of how they like to break bread and they're sharing it with the community. But the pandemic forced everyone to rethink their vision. And the slow crawl back to that vision is proving challenging. Ibrahim Kasif is the owner of one of Australia's best Turkish restaurants, Stan Bully. Ibrahim, how are you? Hi, Hark. Yeah, I'm well, thanks. Mate, um, you've got a pretty amazing restaurant in Enmore in Sydney um, that really changed uh, the discussion on Turkish food in Australia, um, which we'll get to. But I just wonder, can you start by telling us what that sort of early stages of the pandemic was like for you and the impact that it had? Well, um, with the pandemic, I think that, uh, like a lot of restaurants, we were starting to see signs. I mean, you know, there was obviously a lot of talk about uh, this virus going around um, at the back end of last year. And you could see uh, the numbers. Usually we come out of the gates pretty strong at the start of the year. Uh, It's always been a, a, a positive time of year for us, fresh after Christmas, New Year. And then you just it just felt a little bit... Um, deflated it didn't quite have the same numbers coming through and you could see that there was a little bit of a drop which I got me thinking whether was it us was it our was it like our pattern or had it reached its peak and it was dropping like you start sort of thinking about what's happening and and questioning what's happening and then um you know because it is natural to sort of blame um uh, I guess the external factors um but then I think as the conversation heated up about this this thing becoming a pandemic, we started to see uh, the numbers dropping with reservations and a lot more cancellations, um, which hits you pretty hard because you're prepping up and you're getting ready for it and you, you, you're putting a lot of effort into uh, making sure that you've got a, an interesting menu and um, and all of the above. And then all of a sudden, you're just getting all these cancellations. And I think the week where the speculation was really building up in the in the media uh, with what was going to happen. Um, you know, we, we saw a probably a, a 50 to 60% drop. Um, and then it then just was a, just became carnage after that. We were just down probably, I mean, we weren't sure what to do. We weren't even sure when they started making announcements for restrictions and how to, how to, um, how diners were allowed to, to come in. We, we just got, you know, it was just, it was, it was quite dire. We weren't really sure what we're, what we're waiting on. We're sort of waiting for announcements and waiting to see what, what had happened, but uh, what will happen. Um, but it ended up being, um, you know, the, the operation dropped probably 70 to 80% um, the week of. So, um, yeah, it was pretty pretty tough. But I guess the, the, only, the, the, the only thing that was reassuring was everyone was in the same boat. I mean, we were all, everyone, you look across and, you know, we've, a lot of restaurants, like everyone was sort of just feeling the same thing. So we're just sort of in the waiting game, to be honest. What did what did you do in those early days to to adapt and um, you know survive? Really, I mean, this is a business that you created a couple of years ago, and really your vision of um, Turkish cuisine. You know, what have you done in that this period? Well, the first thing we did was we we sort of jokingly said uh, that we'll just turn into a kebab shop and just flip it around and just become a takeaway, which, you know, the cuisine sort of lends itself, that that association for it to be a, a takeaway style cuisine anyway. So I felt like, okay, this will be a simple enough game plan to switch things around and um, do simpler things, um, which um, I guess coincided with, which, which is what we did. We just sort of made made things very simple and we went about doing 
uh, what I what I jokingly say around the restaurant is the dreaded D, the dips, which I don't never championed. I've never I've never had the word dips on my menu when I try and avoid that sort of interpretation of the cuisine, like piden dips and like mixed grills and stuff, skewered meat. I just wasn't that wasn't me um, because I wanted to, I was adamant I wanted to showcase another side of the cuisine that was a little bit more interesting than that. Um, so then I sort of was like, okay, we just have to give the people what they want type of attitude and, and do that. So we we're doing that as takeaway, but it was quite interesting, um, during that period, which was great. I mean, we had a lot of support people were the, our regulars and, um, people that, uh, knew Stambouli that were really supportive and very grateful for how wonderful they were to come and support us in the early weeks of doing takeaway. Um, and it was just a very simple version of what we we're doing. Um, so I, I took away all those sort of the composition salads that I did that was very Turkish and um, the sort of simpler sort of ingredients that I, I championed, like, you know, whether it was, um, you know, dishes based on, on beans or whether it was dishes based on peppers or eggplants. And I did, I did dip, so yogurt-based sort of things that were pureed and a lot simpler, made the bread simpler and all that kind of thing. But, you know, while we are doing it and uh, we were actually having fun in the kitchen and, um, you know, it was good because I could keep a lot of my kitchen staff on because they'd been with me for a while um, and we had a lot of government assistance with that and my restaurant manager was with me the whole time. So we were in it together in that sense. Um, but it was quite – it was it was great because we sort of – it was positive in the sense of resetting and reflecting on what we were doing and who we were as a restaurant um, and what we want to be when we reopen. So the I guess the thought process started to change and – I started thinking, you know what, this isn't as offensive as I thought it was, even though I was always like anti sort of dip plates and things on skewers. Um, I think I feel like, you know what, maybe it is time to just sort of look at what we're doing and what's working, what's not working. So it just became very reflective, I think. Um, and, you know, we ticked along. Obviously, it wasn't – it's not the, the best business model to have just doing sort of takeaway, especially when you are comp- competing with kebab shops and every other – takeaway um incarnation out there so we were just sort of doing us as best as we could um and it just got thinking about what's going to happen in the prep now which is you know now that we can open up for 10 to you know we went up to 10 then to to 30 well we can do 30 now square meterage um so just yeah lots of reflection and um we just started thinking this would be a great opportunity to open the doors and have another crack at a new version of stambouli um, which is what sort of happened. What was it like in that period? Because I know we've discussed it before and you you wanted to change the perceptions of Turkish cuisine as just a takeaway sort of kebab shop and you were forced, your hand was forced to change. You know, what, what was the process in those couple of weeks like when you realised uh, you had to do takeaway but also you realised that, you know, um, changing the model isn't necessarily a bad idea in the end? Um, I think we're just sort of learning on the spot and, and making decisions, um, you know, as, as you're thinking about it, which was, has been a good lesson learned from, I think my time at, at Portenio. Um, I used to see, you know, Elvis do it all the time, just sort of thinking on the, on his feet and making decisions that, you know, you make a decision and then you reassess if it doesn't quite work. And that, that I got, sort of got a lot of confidence from that era when I worked with them and, um, I just thought I'm going to make some changes and I'm just going to see how they go and what the response is and then be fluid enough to sort of change things and tweak things as we go. Um, you know, you, I think, you know, my, my idea of, of restaurants has always been romantic in the sense of a place that's um, a convivial and uh, a place that is welcoming and the food's just delicious. It doesn't have to be a, a culinary epiphany. It doesn't have to be something where you're like, wow, well, you know, well, how do they, you know, how do they do that? That doesn't necessarily for me correlate with a great restaurant experience. For me, I think of all the great restaurants I like to eat in and sometimes it just comes down to, you know what, that's just really delicious. It may not be technically perfect, um, but it's just bloody delicious to eat. And, you know, that was always my brief. It's always been my brief with my food. It just has to be, I, I believe it has to taste yummy and enjoy it. And people can come and uh, relate to it in a sense of, you know what, this is just really yummy. I can come back and eat this. And it's not, um, I'm not confused with what's going on. And, you know, even, you know, the, the sad thing for me was when I thought about it, 
maybe Stambouli started heading that way. Maybe people were getting confused with what I was doing and what what they thought because people have got an idea of what Turkish food is and then all of a sudden they're like, I don't get this. I, I, what's he trying to do here or, or whatever? And that uh, some people do get it, which is great. And then other people were like, yeah, yeah, it was good, but, you know, not good enough to come back. So, um, you know, it's just been good to sort of break things down and, um, you know, we're really excited about the new version of Stambouli because there's only, I think there's only one dish that survived the old version of Stambouli, which is the crushed eggplant salad. Um, but yeah, everything just sort of went on the chopping block and, um, you know, even things like just putting melon and cheese out, I've just had to think, rethink what that means because we had people by the end going, how do I eat this? And you're like, man, it's, it's melon and cheese. Like, is it really that hard to work out how to eat that? But okay, if it's that complicated, then maybe that was like the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I was like, okay, if you don't know how to eat that, then I have to really think about what I'm doing here. Um... So I guess that's that was the process, just really thinking about everything um, and just redoing things and having a, having a new crack at it, I guess. What is Turkish food to you? <sighs> Turkish food for me is um, – it is – it's such an interesting cuisine you know for me it's a cuisine that's still evolving uh it's got incredible history incredible repertoire of dishes and ingredients um you you know for me i've always said to understand food you need to understand history and the history of of turkey the ottoman empire is phenomenal and the what what that history is and the 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 geography the borders and uh who the people are where they came from i mean the first thing is to answer that question is like turkish people are um are people that come from northern china you know and we think of you know they're not middle easterners they they come from they're the nomads that came from china from northern china and the cuisine itself is influenced from the northern Chinese, and it, it travelled through the guts of of the Middle East, um, known as the Spice Trail. And along the way, it is is just like morphed into this incredibly interesting um, story. And you can see the influences in all the countries along the way, um, because they've all got versions of of what mainland Turkey has um, and it's just sort of left its influence along the way. Um, so I think of Turkish food as uh, an incredible can of worms, like where do you start to talk about it? Um, you know, it's a cuisine that's still evolving. I mean, they only – tomatoes are a huge part of the cuisine, for example, and that's only a, that's only been – I think it's just about to tick over 100 years in the last history – in the last bit of history that tomatoes have been part of the cuisine. Wow. So – it's still evolving. It's still evolving as a cuisine. And then every region is incredibly unique. Um, and its influence is phenomenal. I mean, you know, again, it's like, you know, I, I, I'll give you a couple of random examples, which I use a lot. Like, you know, let's use um, dumplings or pasta. You know, who, who created pasta? You know, is it the Chinese or is it the Italian? Who Italians. I mean, they... You know, you've got noodles, you've got one of the most ancient cuisines ever, Chinese cuisine, versus the European cuisine, which came from a lot of influence. I mean, look at look at kitchens. Where did kitchens come from? Again, you have to understand history, and um, the Ottomans were one of the first, if not the first, to champion the closed kitchen. Um, and, you know, the French would would be the first, if you understand French cuisine, where they learnt a lot of the things through that Ottoman era um, and period, um, it's it's really it, it's a can of worms, Huck. Like I don't I don't even know where to start with it. You know, you need a whole series on it, mate. You know, it is an absolute monster of a subject to talk about. But again, you have to understand the history. Um, but for me, Turkish cuisine is is vibrant. To short answer it, it's vibrant. It's um, incredibly a uh, huge range of of um it, you know it, when i think of turkish cuisine it's all about vegetables and um it's all about pulses and veg and um seafood and um just delicious flavors simple 
simple flavors, but really delicious. Um, and it, it you, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that because I'll keep going. Well, let's look at your your history. It, it might um, it might take a whole series to go over Turkish history with cuisine, but let's look at yours. Your grandparents uh, came to Australia with um, one of the first waves of migration um, from that region. Um, what was it like for them uh, when they first got here, and and how did they cope? You know, creating their own food from their homeland. Yep. Yeah, so. My background is Turkish Cypriot. So Cyprus has got its own very unique um, history. It's a divided island. It's, uh, Cyprus is known as, to the world as, as Cyprus, which is a, um, a Greek, uh, I guess known as a Greek sort of island or country. But uh, if you were to speak to a Turkish Cypriot, it would be a very different argument. It's an, it's an island that was occupied uh, by both cultures, Turkish and Greek. Um, who lived harmoniously for a long time. There's always, always going to be natural sort of tensions between two cultures, but they did live harmoniously for a long time. And again, history would suggest uh, how, to, how things get ruined. It usually comes along come the British and make things very complicated. Um, but the British were ruling Cyprus at the time. Um, and my grandparents were both British subjects, so they had British passports and it was... Uh, for my grandfather, late 40s, 1940s. And there was opportunity with a lot of politics building up on the island um, between the Greeks and the Turks. Um, there was an opportunity to leave the island. And my grandfather came out as one of the first wave of Turkish Cypriots as British subjects to come out to to Australia. There were a lot of options. You could have gone to the UK, you could have gone to the US, but they they were they chose to go over to come over to Australia. Um, and my grandfather was quite happy with what he saw here. So he went back, found my grandmother, uh, and then they came out here to settle. And by then it was the, uh, mid to late fifties. Um, and they were part of a very special sort of group of people that got to come out because the people they came out with, I mean, they left a lot of people behind. A lot of them would have left their, their parents and they would have left their siblings because everyone was off doing their own thing. And whoever they came out with became lifelong friends, family friends, and very important people in their lives. Um, but when they did come out in the 50s, it was um, – Australia was a white Australia policy. It was a, a white Australia, which meant they weren't used to <laughs> seeing too many foreigners, too many Europeans. Um, so they were, they were confronted by a very racist Australia as well. Their stories were, were quite hard because – you know, there was a level of um, low tolerance and acceptance for people that were coming into the country. Um, but they they had the attitude, like most immigrants, was to, like, knuckle down and work very hard. And that wave of people that did come out in the 50s, 40s and 50s, um, whether they were Greek or Turkish, Cypriots or any type of immigrant that would have come out in that period, they would have been extremely hardworking and... Um, because it was survival. They only had one way to survive. There wasn't any government handouts. There wasn't anything that we, you think of that the generations that have forged the way for us today and how fortunate we are with a lot of the, the government policies that are in place now. I mean, there was nothing like that for them. They had to work very, very hard, and they did, um, and they, they contributed. They, they, you know, they worked hard. They paid their taxes. They did everything they could. They brought – they um, – you know, they had children, they had a family, and they did their thing. Um, but in the in the same sense, which I think is where your question is going, is they they tried really hard as well to re remember where they came from and keep on to their culture, which was um, Turkish or Turkish Cypriot. Um, and you know, a lot of the the food, my my grandmother would, uh, you know, she only knew how to cook one type of cuisine, and that was um, Turkish food. So. Uh, all of a sudden she's in a foreign country and she's trying to find ingredients that don't exist. And the simplest of ingredients would be, I think, something like olive oil, which we take very much for granted now. Um, but we're not talking about, you know, one of my favourite catchphrases from the modern chef is, oh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't know what this was. Well, 20, 30 years ago, we're talking about, 
well, 20 years ago, we're just talking about 2000s still, so it's not that long ago. And I'm pretty sure in the 2000s, we knew what soy sauce was and balsamic was and olive oil was. So I think our, our time frame's a bit off. I'm talking 50, 60 years ago, there was no olive oil. Um, my grandmother said that she happened to stumble across a chemist and in the, in the medicine section, there was olive oil. <laughs> and she couldn't believe it. She was like, what's this doing here? Um, so she was buying olive oil and uh, she was using it to cook with, not for medicine, whichever, whatever they, I don't know what they were. I mean, she could probably tell the story better than I can, but I think it was for skin ailment of some sort, you know, for the rashes or something. Um, or if you had like stomach pain to rub olive oil on your tummy, you know. Um, so uh, this was, she was cooking with it. So it was as simple as like finding olive oil. Um, which was quite unbelievable. And um, she had to try sourcing greens. Luckily, the cuisine is very vegetable-based. So, you know, finding things like, I guess, spinach and, you know, tomatoes and eggplants and stuff was probably a little bit easier, probably not as easy as now. But, um, you know, uh, pulses were always going to be challenging. But the, thanks to the Greek immigrants and the Italians that were already out here, that they were sort of already paving the way with bringing ingredients out. So, um you know, that's how she held on to the culture. What was it like for you growing up and eating food uh, that was, you know, Western food and growing up in schools here and then going home to having, you know, really beautiful Turkish cuisine as well and having that balance? Do you have any stories from those days? Uh, you know, I'm nothing like, nothing too dramatic. And I, I think the first time it sort of hit me that I had, a, like Turkish breakfasts are a pretty big deal. If you've ever heard of what goes on in, for breakfast in, in Turkish culture, whether it's mainland Turkey or, or Cyprus. I didn't realize how big it was until school camp and I was like in line. I realized then and there that I was um, in all sorts of trouble in the line when um, I was used to having lots of halloumi and olives and tomatoes and cucumbers, like cheeses and jams for breakfast every morning with breads and I'm in line and uh, I'm in the rice bubbles line and I'm like, oh, here we go. I don't know what's going on now. I'm, I, I thought I'm in all sorts of trouble because I've never eaten rice bubbles in my life and I'm on school camp and uh, I can feel like the anxiety just like building up in my body because I'm, I knew I was going to be caught out. I thought, oh, they're going to catch me out now. Like I have no idea what I'm about to do. So I'm watching the guy in front of me put a couple of spoonfuls of rice bubbles and then he put sugar on it and I was like, okay, I'm just sort of copying this guy. I felt like a Mr. Bean episode, you know. I'm just sort of like <laughs> trying to mirror this guy next to me. And uh, I was like, oh, God, what am I eating? You know, I'm like pouring milk on and my stomach was turning. I was like, oh, God, I need like – this is not what I'm used to for breakfast. So I think that's when it sort of hit me. So that was probably about eight or nine years old on school camp that I realized uh, things are a bit different at home <laughs> than uh, what the average Joe was eating outside. Uh, but that was pretty cool nonetheless, you know, learning – about that and um, I guess you realise at school lunches when, you know, kids are polishing off uh, Vegemite sandwiches and you're eating stuffed vegetables um, for leftovers from last night's dinner that there was very different <laughs> different things going on at home compared to everyone else. So, um, yeah, I, was, I think um, lucky enough in the sense that I'm, a th I'm second generation. So my, my dad was was born here and he, he was influenced a lot from, um, I guess, Australians and their cuisine or whatever that cuisine is, which is a loose term, I guess, at the, in the 50s. But I think it's better defined now than what it was in the 50s. Um, growing up in, in the 60s and, and seeing how people ate. So there was a little bit of exposure. And then when my grandmother, um, she, was a, she worked in a, in a hospital um, and she, she used to help uh, in the kitchen and she used to she learnt about roasting um, uh, joints of meat, whether it's lamb or beef, and making gravy and roasting vegetables. So she saw all that on hand when she was working at, at the hospital, um, which was pretty cool. So she there was a little bit of exposure. Um, so I wasn't totally foreign to other cuisines growing up. But you know, you come home and definitely have Turkish based food, whether it's you know braised pulses of some sort, whether it's white beans or eating a black-eyed bean salad or, you know, braised um, meat with okra or green beans. You know, that was very much normal um, food for me. Um, and, you know, 
yeah, when you're a kid, you don't really realise, I think, until you're older, that, again, people are doing things a bit differently at home. <laughs> How did it feel when you, um, you know, took all of your rich history and the food that you grew up with and you had the chance to open your own restaurant with Stambouli? You know, what's, what's it been like having your own uh, identity with the Turkish cuisine? Uh, it's been fun. It's been really liberating, I think. Um, you know, you go through phases. Like when I first, again, even when I started cooking, um, which was in the um, early 2000s, I, um, out of school and got into got into an apprenticeship, I wasn't, you know, that the, the, the fashion in food, I think, in the early 2000s was mod Oz. Mod Oz food, I guess, modern Oz, um, and which was a, again a very loose term of a, a cross crossover of European and French influences and Italian influences. But then, you know, um, by the mid two thousands and and later two thousands, I felt like Asian uh, cuisines, whether it was Thai um, or Southeast Asian, is probably a, the best way to describe it. Was very fashionable. Um, so I went through a bit of confusion with what I felt like. I wanted to do with food. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with food until um, I had finished my apprenticeship and I always had this idea that maybe Mod Oz or I had to learn Southeast Asian to the point where I actually went to Thailand um, and uh, was did a bit of work in a hotel just to sort of learn how to cook um, Thai food because I thought that's maybe where the food was going. And, you know, um, you think of the great restaurants in the 2000s whether it was Rockpool or, you know, you'd hear of the great stories of David Thompson's influence in, in Thai food and, and you know, you think of Kylie Kong's Billy Kong and all that. There was a lot, so many amazing uh, restaurants that had that that Asian slant to it. So I thought that's what had to happen. Um, but it wasn't until I – and I never I never gave the credit to, to Turkish food until I, I travelled as a young adult around – Europe and I went went to Turkey and spent some time in Turkey and here I am eating Turkish food um, which I, I didn't give it enough credit to even as a young chef I was just I never thought about it um, in in a, as a way of, of cooking um, professionally it was like a penny drop moment when I'm eating the cuisine that so, seems to have been so familiar to me and I grew up eating and it was just here it is in front of me and it wasn't dips and it wasn't things on skewers. It was just like the most incredible version, uh, which was just like little plates of really interesting vegetables and seafood and um, grilled meats, again, that weren't on skewers. And I'm just sitting there and I'm eating and it's just like a penny drop moment where you're like, wow, he, like, I'm eating stuffed mussels, I'm eating melon and cheese. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is just incredible. I'm eating a fish sandwich, you know, down the foreshore of the Bosphorus. And I'm, it's all there. The answers are just in front of me. And I'm like, this is what I want to be doing. This is what I should be doing. I can't believe it, 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 it's taken me, or well, felt like at that moment, it's taken me so long. And then I just sort of, that became it. I, just, I started formulating that and what I wanted to do with Turkish food. Um, and then you just start seeing, you know, I've always likened, like, funnily enough, when people say, oh, how do you, like, what do you want to do? Like, how do you see your Turkish food? I always likened to, to what Kylie Kwong has done with Billy, like, what she used to do with Billy Kwong. Um, it was, like, just uh, as such a beautiful interpretation of Chinese food. And I was like, that, that's the, that was actually the, the greatest influence. And then, you know, I was really fortunate enough to work for Ben and Elvis, and you think of their la, la, their sort of la, that Latin South American influence they have in their food, and it's just like beautiful flavors. Is it is it like the most technical food? No, it's just like really bang on flavors and really just delicious food to eat, and that's the most inspiring. You know, um, that's like wow. That's you know, you could I could easily slant that with how I want Turkish food to be. So they were always my benchmark. Um, sort of inspirations. Um, I, I used to work for uh, Peter Canistas as well, who, who at the time had Amiga in the early 2000s, and it just won like Best New Restaurant, Two Hats, all that. And he was doing modern Greek, and it was like a really fancy version of Greek. But, you know, he still had that – he was still grounded by familiarity. Like when you ate something, you're like, whoa, 
that's like the best version of beans I've ever had or the best version of eggplant I've ever had. He still had that almost, that really subtle um, humbleness to his food, which I really just admired a lot. So it just felt like the answers were always just like staring me in the face. Um, and then when I got the, when I was working, I guess at Portenio, I sort of said to Elvis, man, this is going to be my last stop. I think I just have to have a go at making, at doing Turkish food and have a, have a crack at it. And he was just like, yeah, man, let's just, just do it. Like, why don't you, we'll help you do it. And you know, like, let's just back yourself and, and have a go. If you believe in it, just, you know, rip in and, you know, see what happens. So that, that was just, again, very liberating to have that sort of backing, uh, that support behind me. Um, so yeah, when I got to open the doors and I was just doing stuffed mussels and everything that I felt like is real Turkish food, like fish sandwiches and, you know, eating, um, you know, grilled fish, whether it's sardines or fried little babunya or, you know, stuffed mussels, as I said numerous times, crushed eggplant salad, you know, really interesting compositions like olive salads and, um, salads just made from fried peppers or whatever, just like things that are just, that is quintessential Turkish. But again, you just people wouldn't know it because they just know the kebab shop um, colors of dips, whether it's, you know, all these hybrids of Turkish food um, and not very real. So that was, that's what people sort of knew. And I just, I wasn't out to challenge it for, to be a smart ass. I was just challenging it in the sense of there's actually a lot more to the cuisine than meets the eye. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very liberating. Now you've recently opened the doors. And you're pushing forward. Um, what's the version of Stambouli that's uh, come to fruition through the pandemic? I know you've got limited numbers, but what's what are we what are we going to see? And and what have you been doing? Um, I think uh, now now that we've opened the doors, I just wanted to really, um, I guess, rethink how I was doing things. Um, and I just I think the the brief had to be it has to be fun, and it has to be. Um, a version where people feel like a lot more, I don't know. I just wanted to make, make it comfortable again for people to get and not feel like, oh, this is just complicated or I'm not getting why there's so many little plates of, of mezze coming out. I don't know how to eat this. And so I've, I've dumbed it down a bit. Um, still being true to me and making things, the brief, like I said, just has to be delicious for me. And, um, just looking at again, another version of, of the cuisine that, there's so many different versions of the cuisine to explore. And uh, I've, I guess I'm inspired by modern modern Istanbul, I guess, which is, um, I guess, quite dynamic and cosmopolitan. And you think of things like, again, I'm re-exploring the fish sandwich. I'm re-exploring things like, um, like over there right now, they've got at least like this really weird sort of street food called soggy hamburgers. Um, which is just like these oversteamed hamburgers that people are just sort of like frothing on. It's just a, a street food that uh, even you know y- you would have seen it maybe on Anthony when Anthony Bourdain did um, did his episode in Istanbul. He was polishing off a, a soggy hamburger. So we're doing our, our we're doing exactly that version. A um, bit more inspired by home cooking. This version of Stambouli. So um, you know, like we're doing a very Cypriot style Turkish Cypriot style. Uh, pasta dish which is just like noodles cooked in um, in chicken broth and you boil like basically you just have to boil a chicken use that broth to boil your pasta grate lots of halloumi and dried ricotta over the top and um, crisp up the chicken that you've just poached and and serve and it's just like a really peasant dish which is just super delicious Um, so we do. I don't know. We sort of. We, we, our, our new version is, is is just keeping the brief as everything really delicious, but um, I think just a bit more dynamic. <laughs> I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and just inspired by all all sorts of the versions of the cuisine, not just the mehanes, which used to do meze. Well, mate, I can't wait to experience the new stand bully for myself. As you know, I've always been a big fan, especially of the fish sandwiches sitting at the bar um keep in touch i really appreciate you sharing your story with us today and we'll speak to you soon thanks for having me this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep 
stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.